All right, so it's really fun to think about subsidies from one ecosystem to another. Um, and a lot of ecosystems receive these outside subsidies, which allow for more production than would occur if they were relying on autochthonous energy sources alone. Um, so one of the ones that I study the most is allochthonous inputs to streams. Um, but there are some other really cool cross ecosystem subsidies. So I'll just talk about a few. Um, one, or actually, um, there's a really cool movie that highlights a few of these different subsidies. Um, it's about uh, a scientist named Shigeru Nakano, who was an influential Japanese ecologist who was studying streams in Japan. And there's a really cool movie called River Webs um, that talks about his work. So um, I have a copy of this if anyone wants to watch it. We could do a screening in Gather Town. Okay, so um, this is one of the papers that uh, he published with his co-author um, Murakami, Masashi Murakami. And um, basically they did this really cool thing. He was inspired by the greenhouses all over Japan. And he basically built this snaky greenhouse that covered over a stream completely. And what the greenhouse did, it wasn't really trying to heat it up necessarily. It was made with um, a fine mesh, the covering, but it allowed Shigeru Nakano and his co-author to separate the insects that were emerging from the stream and collect them versus the insects that were falling down into the stream from the forest. And once they were able to separate those things, they were able to kind of follow those two different sources of food throughout the system. And so what they found, this is kind of a, a complicated figure, what they found was that the proportion of allochthonous prey eaten by what's shown on birds on the top and fish on the bottom, there's this really cool opposite pattern. So if we have the months ordered along the bottom, May, June, July, August, September, October, we have kind of the summer months on the left, and then we have winter in the middle and then spring, um, March, April, May, June on the right. What you can see is in the summer months, fish are really relying on allochthonous prey. And that means in the summer, they're relying on prey that's falling from the forest into the stream. The opposite is true for the birds. In the summer, they're not relying on allochthonous prey at all. They're in the forest eating forest insects. But in the winter time, they're relying on allochthonous prey. And in that case, that means stream insects emerging into the forest. And so, and there you can see for the winter, the fish are, are not relying on allochthonous prey at all. They're eating aquatic insects in the winter. So this is really cool research showing this kind of reciprocal subsidy between forests and streams and the influences on birds and fish. So here's just some, some uh, another figure from this paper showing that different species of birds rely more heavily on aquatic prey. Um, and different species of fish rely more heavily on terrestrial prey. And so there's, there's also variation in terms of who's doing the, the predating um, and how much they might rely on aquatic or terrestrial prey. There's another study here looking at a trophic interception um, with these uh, Jared water striders. So we know that water striders are voracious predators they can intercept terrestrial prey that falls into the stream, but they can also intercept aquatic insects that emerge out of the stream. And this study was conducted up in BC in John Richardson's lab. Um, and what they found was that water striders capture significantly more prey when they're found in isolated pools versus um, contiguous pools or riffles. And that water striders capture prey from small and medium sized classes and fewer from size classes that are large or adults. Um, they also found that both fish and water striders will interact to influence prey capture. And then they have these different figures showing what happens in a pool with water striders versus a pool without water striders. And so it's just this really cool um, kind of interaction in these in these um, pools. And then this last paper by Tiffany Knight and co-authors shows this um, really neat pathway by which fish can facilitate plant reproduction. And so we have fish and they're eating larval dragonflies, which means there are fewer dragonflies in the in the going off and emerging 
and those dragonflies are preying on pollinator species. And so if you reduce the number of pollinators, you cause an increase in the number, or sorry, if you reduce, reduce the number of predatory dragonflies, then you cause a an increase in the number of pollinators. So it's this like crazy food web where it's showing these trophic interactions where the, what happens in the stream or the pond can actually influence pollination on land. So here is the number of visits per shrub per 20 meter, me, minutes um, goes up when you have fish in the system versus no fish. So this is a pretty cool study. And here we can see the number of visits per flower when dragonflies are absent is much higher than when dragonflies are present. So in this case, the dragonflies are acting like a top predator. Um, and this is a, an example of a trophic cascade. Okay, so another cool thing to um, wonder about in terms of ecosystems is biodiversity. How important is biodiversity for how ecosystems work? Now, most of us would argue, well, of course, biodiversity is really important, but it took us doing some very explicit studies to really understand how that's true. And especially in freshwater ecosystems where we know both biodiversity is very high, they tend to be biodiversity hotspots, and many species are at risk of extinction in freshwater habitats, this is really important research to do. So for example, studies have found that diverse assemblages of net spinning caddisflies can filter more out of the water than less diverse communities. Um, and this is partly because, um, well, they aren't functionally redundant. The different types of net spinning caddisflies are gonna filter in different ways. And so you can't call all net spinning caddisflies um, the same. Uh, there's a lot of variation in there. And so um, this goes kind of against what's called the neutral theory in ecology, which is basically like, well, you know, as long as there's a plant and there's um, something that eats the plant and something that eats that thing, you'll have an ecosystem that functions because we don't really need all the different plants. They're functionally redundant, um, which I think there's a lot of evidence to say that that's not really the case. So both species richness and phylogenetic diversity are important. Um, it's important that we have both a rich community in terms of the number of species, but that also there's functional diversity um, and that comes about by both genetic, um, genetic diversity, environmental diversity, and um, in different roles that, you could, that, that organisms play. Now, the way that I'm connected to this work is that um, through my PhD work, we were interested in biodiversity and ecosystem function, but at a genetic variation within species level. And so this gave rise to some really cool research called genes to ecosystems research, where we were interested in how does genetic variation influence ecosystem function? Is it the same as biodiversity or species richness? Um, is it different? How, how is it different? And so um, we're kind of surrounded by this work here in the Pacific Northwest. We have black cottonwoods all around us. And black cottonwood or Populus trichocarpa was actually the first tree to be genomically sequenced. And that tree was named Nisqually One. It's um, a mama tree found in the Nisqually River. I think she unfortunately passed away in the wild, but she exists in lots of common gardens and research facilities um, to share what we've learned about her genome with the world. And so here's just a, a brief introduction to kind of genes to ecosystems. If you think about something like a tree, it has a traditional phenotype. So it's made up of a genotype and depending on where it's growing, it will exhibit traits like, like leaf chemistry and architecture and bark depth and um, you know, production, biomass. So those are all its traditional phenotypes. And then it has a community phenotype. And so um, different organisms might interact with it like aphids or galling insects or birds might build um, nests in trees or beaver might take trees of particular genotypes based on their chemistry. So how, how an organism interacts with all of those interacting community members can be considered its community phenotype. And then finally, its ecosystem level phenotype would be things like how does it decompose? How, how much water use does it um, pump into the atmosphere through transpiration? Um, what's its nutrient cycling uh, rates? How is it connected to its microbial communities? And so um, a lot of this work was summarized in a paper in 2006 in Nature Reviews Genetics, but 
Um, basically, it shows how something like a traditional phenotype like condensed tannin concentrations in the leaves might influence things like terrestrial communities and aquatic communities and the infection um, by endophytes or other, other organisms. And they can also, that traditional phenotype of tannin production can also influence things like nitrogen mineralization rates or aquatic decomposition rates. And um, things like foliar chemistry, we know, like condensed tannins can influence beaver herbivory. And then once beavers are taking trees of different um, genotypes, it can influence overall population genetics for the trees and, and stand composition and fitness. Um, and it might influence um, if changes in tannins change how nitrogen is mineralized, then it can also influence how the trees um, produce their fine roots and then feed back to tree fitness. And so all of these really interesting connections between your traditional phenotype, your community phenotype, your ecosystem phenotype, and how that might influence um, your own fitness. So things like um, how, the, how the tree's genetics influence growth rate, water cycling, biodiversity, low ground carbon storage, root production, and nutrient cycling. And if you're interested in more about this, you can watch this uh, documentary called A Thousand Invisible Chords Connecting Genes to Ecosystems. Okay, I'm gonna come back and talk about the river continuum concept next.